So welcome everyone. I am here with Joe Hudson, who is one of my favorite coaches. And also, if you've been to the Transformative Technology Conference, you would know that for the entire period from 2015 to 2019, I asked Joe to come to the conference every time because of the way that starting the event with the type of teaching he does, just really got everyone in the mood with the right courage to connect and to build the things that humanity really needs. And so, Joe, thank you so much for of this course. conversation. I'm really excited about the work. Everybody, I have been, because of the period of time that I got to see Joe's work at my conference, I also have done a lot of work with Joe, and it's had a big effect on me um, and it has really helped me have the courage uh, to step into things like investing as well as some of the other work that I'm doing. So Joe, thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Good to be here with you. Yeah. So um, one of the reasons why I reached out to you is because my community is a Twitter uh, with uh, chat GPT and AI and just really thinking about what does it mean to be human in this age of AI? You know, we are really interested in transformation and people who are starting to use these tools, thinking about these tools, reflecting on these tools are starting to ask, you know, like, how should we be? How should we be with these tools? What are the types of things as founders, as builders, we should be thinking about when there's really powerful technologies around. Yeah, you know, there's so much stuff that happens, uh, having been through this cycle a couple of times where big technologies happen. And then, of course, this one is particularly special in the fact that it has this capacity potentially to um, uh, think for itself, which is clearly like a completely different world than we've ever experienced before. I think typically what happens in these situations is that people feel um, fear and excitement and they get those two things confused often. So one of the things that I see is everybody's like, oh my gosh, I have to move. I have to move quickly. Things are changing and I have to go. And that's not always um, the most effective way. I, my experience is that a lot of that, like if you look at the course of technology, that happened with search engines, that happened with crypto, that happened. And there's like a chance you're going to hit it big if you act in fear and move quickly. And there's also a high chance that that is going to go away, that, that, that the gains that you've made will go away. And oftentimes the ones that are uh, that exist over an extended period of time that are really the big hits of those technology plays are the people who had a clear vision that they were going for outside of the specific um, moment in time. So it's uh, the folks like an Amazon or a Google that had a lot of competition. They weren't first movers and they ended up becoming these substantial companies because they had a really clear vision that was outside of the, oh my gosh, moment. And so what I'm noticing now is there's a lot of fear or excitement that's confused um, in the space and investing in that, whether it's your time or whether it's your talent, is is not the the best way to to go it's it's far more and just like anything when you have fear in the solution or you're trying to solve a problem out of fear is the better way to say it then you're you're usually recreating that fear for yourself and so that's the main thing that i see happening right now I, the other thing that i think is really important is the consciousness in which you bring to the tool and so it doesn't matter whether your tool is a paintbrush or your tool is a chisel or your tool is AI, the consciousness that you bring to it is going to have a huge effect on what you create. And it's going to have a huge effect on your happiness in creating it. Both, I would say, extremely important. Yeah. One of the things that I'm noticing in the world too is, you know, like you said, there's definitely this fear and there's this FOMO that people are having about whether or not they'll miss it. But I remember when we first started talking about transformative tech several years ago, what I noticed was that the consciousness that people had when they built 
it showed up in the software. It showed up in the user journey, the client journey, every single decision that they made. And yes. so, you know, so it sounds like we should talk a little bit about fundamentals because it's it's still the fundamentals. So, you know, I'm a founder. Let's say, you know, I'm a founder. Tell me you know, what are the sort of things that that I should be thinking about when I'm separating fear from excitement and thinking about what to build, you know, in this in this accelerated age right now. Yeah. I think one of the things that I see, so most of the people that I've run across in Transtech are trying to do something good for the world. Like they're they're saying, oh, I want to build a technology that will help humanity. And a trap I see there with a lot of CEOs and and founders who are doing that is that part of what they're trying to do is feel good. Um, by helping other people. And mm. that mentality often sacrifices a company for an individual. Mm -hmm. So one advantage that greed has, and I'm not suggesting being greedy because it's, you know, it's hell on earth, but uh, one of the advantages greed has is it's really easy to justify letting go of these 30 people to save the company because the company represents, you know, your ability to get what you want. For people who are really looking to feel good in their life by helping other people, when you have to let go of that one person or those two people for the benefit of the company, whether that's because you have to do a riff or whether their consciousness is just actually hurting the company and it's and it's making everybody else perform uh, at a substandard level, th those calls are really hard for people to make who are trying to save them. So that's one of the things that I would say. It's is to be able to see that the compassionate thing to do is to be take care of the whole. And as the CEO of a company, that's your job is to take care of a whole, not to take care of an individual. Mm -hmm. And in that hiring people that are only like nines or tens is critical. If I, I the way I would, I talk to my clients about this, who are, who are running really big companies is I say, if you have to hire somebody you need to manage, they're not qualified. And yeah. so like managing, if you're at a top level, really wanting to build a great company and you have to manage everybody, that's a lot of work. So why not hire people that just don't require management? And and the consciousness behind that, which is critical, is it it's we feel like it's an I deserve that, but it's not um, because it everybody deserves whatever they they're getting. But it's more of a I can accept that kind of um, both power and uh, expansive feeling. It's a very expansive feeling to be around people who are really contributing and you're working together as a team. And most people, that feeling is scary because they're scared it's going to go away. Mm -hmm. And so to allow those two feelings in your system, which is creates even more excitement, which has a more tendency to move into fear is is a real big part of it. So those are the things I think team is critical, most critical thing. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that has really been such a useful tool for me has been the view, vulnerability, impartiality, empathy, and wonder. And yeah. so, you know, that's something that I learned with you and um, that actually uh, there's a couple of times that you did it at the conference and that's yeah. really just been an essential tool for me. And so when I think about building and when I think about, you know, the steps that I'm taking, you know, one of the things that I notice is that like whenever I'm, you know, when, when I'm feeling that I have an agenda, when I'm feeling that, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, moving something and I might, and I get afraid that I might not get what I want. Um, then I like go through, I, I, I actually start with wonder because that's the easiest one for me. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I just like shift into wonder. And what I've noticed is that, you know, then I, then, you know, the, the outcomes of those conversations, even if it's not what I intended, or if it is what I intended, it just, you know, feels better. Um, yeah. and so I'm wondering if you could tell me what you think about, uh, you know, the view as it relates to hiring, as it relates to team building, um, yeah. as it relates to being a founder right now. 
Yeah. Yeah, I would say it's critical. So the, the way that a lot of like, especially engineers think about, you know, problem solving is they say it's like looking at a patient on the table, there's like kind of a, a, a clarity of there's nothing personal here. We're just going to look at the problem and solve it. And view is a way to do that, but also to remain emotionally open. And the emotionally open part is really important if you're going to create community communication that is fluid and 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 uh, just uh, iterative in a way that's effective very quickly. And so the thing that I would say there is that if you have a team of people, and there's this great study called the Aristotle Project, if you ever want to look at it, that Google did, if you look at like really effective teams, even if they change what they're doing, these teams remain effective because that communication is really clear where people can have opposing points of view and everybody's voices are... Um, have have equal weight in the team as a matter of fact that's how when i was a venture capitalist that's how i would assess one of the ways i'd assess a company is if i met with the team and only the ceo spoke i was like this is trouble this is not going to work and so having that thing and what that drives is what that drives is like three things the first one is you get people's best ideas so i have an idea of how we should proceed i say let's build a the first thing I do in a team is say, okay, what speaks against that? Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, okay, let's all get behind A, we're going to do A now, yay, alignment. I'll look around and I'll say, what speaks against it? Because everything that anybody says is going to help me create a better A, like a, or maybe find a B that's better than A. And so to really be able to hear all those problems allows for a better solution then secondarily everybody is aligned because everybody feels like their hesitations have been heard and addressed and so it's not consensus it's it's literally figuring out what all the no's are so that i can build a better product or have a better solution you can't do that if you're trying to manage people's outcomes if you are not being in wonder if you're not vulnerable about being wrong if you're not, if you're totally partial about your way or being the smartest and so the, that's that's why view really works there. And then on top of it, people feel aligned, then people feel heard, then people feel like they have choice. It's just, it makes for really efficient teams of thinkers. You know, you can get away with it in like a manufacturing line not to do this, but if you're dealing with a whole bunch of smart people whose jobs are to contribute great ideas, you know. Yeah. And I also think, work. you know, one of the things that's happening now is that, um, the world is just getting more and more, you know, volatile. Like it just really is, you know, it's like, I think, you know, the, the beginning of the year started with Silicon Valley bank and then, you know, and, and, and I think we're going to have something every month. I think this is the way it is because we're in an acceleration right now. And so I think that the only way to really, you know, the only way to really be successful and to manage in that is that you really have to, you know, you really have to do, you really kind of have to be in the view. You have to be able to like reduce the ego, reduce the friction and um, be able to work with people in that way. You know, I, I, I did something the other day, which I don't know if I would have, you know, done it before sort of like our last workshop really. <laughs> but um, I had, um, I had a proposal and I sent it out uh, to someone and they let me know they hated it. <laughs> they were like, this is, they were like, no. And so I texted back, um, you know, and they were like, I'm open to discuss it. And so I texted back and I said, I'd really like to know the top five things you hated most. Yeah. I want to hear those things. Yeah. And, um, and this is a very busy person and they were nervous to send that to me. And we talked for two hours and awesome. I got such good feedback yeah. and, and I got what I needed to know to be able to actually transition it into what I hoped it would be. And so, but it really came from being like, you know, being vulnerable, yeah. um, being really curious, having wonder like, okay, what are those five things? You know, what are those, what might those five terrible things be? And asking yeah. for it 
you know, in a, in a way um, that they felt really comfortable uh, with it. Yeah. And, and so I think that, you know, I think we're going to need to see more of that, um, you know, and, and that's how it showed up for me personally. Yeah. I think you were also doing something else there, which is, I think, really critical, which is you were leaning into the discomfort. You were embracing intensity in that moment. And that is so important for anybody starting a company to do, yeah. um, to be able to say what's like to actually say all the things I don't want to look at, I'm going to go look there to be able to say, oh, all the things I don't want to feel, I'm going to go feel them. And this is critical, I think, for multiple reasons. One is the one that you just said. If you look in the drawer that nobody wants to look in, you're going to be able to find stuff and fix stuff that nobody else is fixing. But additionally, the way we make decisions, if like I took the emotional center of your brain out of, out of your brain, you would cease to make decisions. Even though your IQ would be the same, um, what would happen is that it would take you a half an hour to just dis- to dis- to decide which color pen to use, or it would take you four hours to decide where to have lunch. And so we do make emotional decisions. We use our logic to basically try to figure out what what decision will make us feel good, right? That's what we're using the logic for. (laughs) And if you look at like any SWOT analysis you've ever done, if some great authority that you fully trusted said, A, will make you happier and more content than B, like the SWOT analysis is no longer important, right? So so that's how we make decisions. And so to get clarity on decision-making isn't through logic, it is through being able to feel anything. Oh, I'm happy to feel like a failure. I'm happy to feel like a success. I'm happy to feel um, constrained for a while. I'm happy to feel expansive. Because if you're happy to feel all that stuff, your decisions become super clear. And so as somebody is not worried about the rejection, not feeling it, they can absolutely ask the person, hey, tell me all the ways I screwed up here so that I don't do that again. And so that's such a critical thing. And and leaders who can do that seem fearless. And so people really want to follow them. They really want to follow the person who's not avoidant, who's decisive, who's able to listen to being challenged, all those things. Those are the people that that most people want to follow these days. And so that's another critical piece. Just to say that there was something else going on besides you. You were leaning into that, the challenge, which is so critical. Yeah, you know, I when I look back on who I was when we first met, you know, and and um, you know, what I'm what I'm, you know, doing now, I mean, I guess it just sort of like what I, what I try to do or what, you know, or what I lean into is just moving from my head into my heart and into my feelings and, and really allowing, you know, my body, um, and my feelings to, to, um, uh, to help me, uh, understand, uh, and to help me be in this situation, uh, whatever it is. We've been reading as a community a lot of books on embodiment and sensory, um, and and part of it I think you know I mean I picked the books so <laughs> you know a lot of it is just really me you know moving out of my head and you know and and being more um, you know being more balanced um, and and recognizing the roles that the role that emotion plays. Um, yeah. And not running from those, um, you know, not running from those anymore. This is really, this is really critical, not just to what you're speaking about, but also like the formation of AI, right? So like, if you think about that same metaphor, you know, if you look at Gödel's theory of mathematical incompleteness, it basically shows you that there is no logic that doesn't require either it it either contradicts itself at some point or it requires a postulate and so our the way our brain works is our postulates are the emotions right are these hormonal things that say you need to survive or they say uh you know dopamine works like this so you feel good when you get things done like we have these and all of our logic all the stuff is just operating 
as a way to serve that hormonal, that emotional uh, part of our humanity. And those are our postulates, if you will. And so if you're creating something like AI, or if you're creating a technology and you do it fully from intellect, it can be great or it can be horrible. We all know there's this great saying that I've heard recently in Silicon Valley is something to the effect of another absolutely brilliant pe- an absolutely brilliant person who's a moron. And you see these people that are just so brilliant, but they they make decisions that piss off their entire company in a non-productive way, or they make a decision that makes it so their their business it's twice as hard for their business to do the thing. And it shows you that intelligence on its own doesn't quite work. What actually you need to pay attention to is those postulates and how do you change them from, oh, right, my postulate is that dopamine is great, so I'm going to scroll all the time because I get all these dopamine hits. And that was great 20 years ago or 200 years ago or 2,000 years ago, no longer great. And now I have to actually think about my dopamine and how I'm handling it. And this is the pro- the in- interesting thing with AI is that as they build it, they have to assume some postulates. And how do those postulates change as the world changes around around it? Which is, I think, just absolutely fascinating, but very specific to building a business. Is that if you are building a business and your postulates are one thing at the beginning of the business. They're going to have to be very different by the time your business is a two or $3 billion company. Hmm. You can't have the same, oh, I'm trying to make my team really happy at 20 persons, which is really where you're focused on getting that camaraderie at, you still want to do that at a $2 billion business, but there's other things that you also have to take into consideration. And so it's this really amazing experience to learn how to make those things or allow those things to change in you as the environment changes. Mm, yeah. Um, so one more question, um, yeah. you know, I, and thank you for the time. I, I know that you have a busy schedule. Of course. Um, right now, the topic of the day uh, really is uh, technology safety and AI safety. Yeah. And so um, I'm, and I'm noticing that um, again, there's a lot of fear around it. There's a couple of different camps of people saying, you know, move faster and other people saying, slow down. Um, you know, one of the things that that I, you know, have thought is that it's really hard to stand in today and know what will go wrong in the future. And so I'm wondering if you could speak to a little bit about what you've noticed about how someone can be the person who can make the decision that they need to in the moment? Like, how do you think about today versus tomorrow? And what does it mean for leaders? Yeah. So there's a personal story I have around this. When I was building the business that I'm, that I do now, um, there's a five or six times where something really sexy showed up, some person I really wanted to work with, or some employee who could do a whole bunch of stuff. And, oh, I wanted that thing. I wanted that thing, right? And so I would I would like get blinded by that thing. And I noticed every time that never worked out. It just never worked out. That and there was always some sign of like, oh yes, you want it, but there's a red flag that you're not paying attention to. And maybe it would have worked out if I would have brought all the red flags to attention, but I didn't. And so the question that I would ask anybody in that situation is are you are you in the moment paying attention to what doesn't feel right is far more important than like figuring it out 10 steps in advance and are you saying it and are you out loud saying here's what doesn't feel right right now because what happens is it's in that moment that you're either craving some future which is fear-based or you are trying to prevent some future, which is fear-based, or you're trying to make a big decision, oh, should I, should I not, which is fear-based. Instead, and just going, oh, this doesn't feel right. I'm going to speak to it until it feels right, or until we've made a decision that feels right. And to have that kind of freedom is really challenging. It's a really challenging thing to say, I, I, I am going to stand in what feels right in this moment, no matter what the future consequences are. 
as it turns out, it's a far more effective way to get the, the future consequences that you want. The future you want is a far more effective way to get there than to try to figure it all out or to try to manage it rather than just being in that moment and saying, oh, this doesn't feel good this or this feels great except for this thing. And that that kind of freedom where you're not defined by what you've created, why you're not defined by... Um, by the value that you bring or the problem that you solve, you're defined by, are you being in your truth? Mm. That's the thing that changes. That's the thing that will help anybody creating this technology to make it safe mm. rather than operating out of fear. My experience is whatever we're trying to avoid in that fear is what we create from that fear. So if I'm scared that I'm going to be rejected by you, I'm going to behave in such a way either get angry or get needy with that. It makes it so you're more likely to reject me. And oh. that same thing happens in a company. That same thing happens that the thing they're trying to avoid out of fear is the thing that they create. And so it's yeah. far better to be present and be free in the moment. Yeah. And, and you make a great point too, is it sort of like, there is no such thing as compartmentalization. Like there, there is no such thing, you know, whatever, yeah. Whatever we do, whatever, well, I'll just make it personal. Whatever I do personally, it's the same thing I do professionally. Whatever it is I do professionally, it's the same thing that I do personally. And that's why I think that for founders, growth work is essential. Like it just, oh, yeah. it's the reason why I brought you in at the very beginning, um, because I wanted Trans Tech to, you know, I, I wanted to, to spark Trans Tech companies and and, you know, and I just knew that, you know, growth work is essential for founders, especially when they're building powerful things. Yeah. Well, Joe, I, I so, I so appreciate you. I, I really do. Um, everybody, Joe is doing a webinar and a masterclass where you can get a chance to see him coach live. Um, it's stunning. Maybe be coached. Uh, it's an opportunity to be coached by a master coach. And um, since we didn't have a conference last year, um, I wanted to, when I found out that there was this opportunity that you could experience him, um, since we didn't have a conference last year for you to be able to do it, um, I asked him to come on so I could tell you about it because I personally have gotten so much out of it. And, and the things that I'm working on now and, um, you know, and, and the things that I believe are possible now are things that you know, even a few years ago, I did not believe were possible. Um, and so that Q&A and live coaching uh, and masterclass is going to, or Q&A and live coaching is going to be on May 16th. And so you can register for it in the link. Um, so Joe, any last things that you, you know, what would you like um, the community to know um, before we close this out? Yep. Only thing else I'd say is that the um, if you, for whatever reason, are short on time or you want to discover more about the fear part of this or the uh, how we create our fears, um, there's a podcast. There's some podcasts uh, that we have on um, on fear and and other emotions. We also have a podcast on. It's called the Golden Algorithm. It's one of the more recent ones about how we recreate. Um, the things we're trying to avoid. And so that's all at Art of Accomplishment, um, mm. the podcast Art of Accomplishment, and that's free. So if you, for whatever reason, can't make and see the the live work, the really powerful stuff, then you can you can get into the podcast and see if that works for you. Yeah, yeah. the golden algorithm, by the way, people, that's like, I, when I listened to it, I was like, oh yeah, I do that and I do that <laughs> and I do that. Um, so definitely uh, go check out the podcast. Um, they're all free. They're all online and they're brilliant. So yeah. also, okay. also just want to say thank you, Nicole, for doing everything you do in the world. And I really appreciate how much care and love you give towards the technology and transformation in general. Thank you. Thanks.